Have you ever worked somewhere so long that the days have kind of blended together and you forget when it started and when it ends? That's the feeling I got when I began work at this call center downtown. The place is constantly busy and that, that really isn't the problem, but my mind tends to wander and I sometimes can't shake the feeling that what I'm doing here doesn't really matter. I've even voiced these concerns to my boss, who's insisted that big changes are coming and they'll reinvigorate the workplace, but I'm not sure. What we're doing here just doesn't seem to matter. A day is just a day, and I've often lost track of weeks at a time. I got so bad that last week I, I asked if I could be placed in a different shift, and maybe that would switch things up a bit. Graveyard was the only one available, so I figured, you know, why not? Let's see where it takes me. The first few nights are pretty routine. Boring, starting to make me regret ever signing up for the change. But then something extraordinary happened. I was wandering the halls up near the fourth floor trying to find the restroom because the ones on the floor I work on were being remodeled and I noticed a door that I had never seen before. The way this building's set up, you see, the, the offices that we work at normally face west and we can see a little bit of the mountains that dip over the horizon. It's a pretty scenic view, almost enough to make you think... What you're doing here, stuck in a cubicle all day, actually means something. But anyways, the point is that this side of the building is mostly large panel windows, ones that show off the epic desert area and the valleys beyond. We're kind of out here in the middle of nowhere, right? And it's, it's a bit lonely, it's solemn, I guess. And there definitely shouldn't have been a door in the middle of that hallway, leading to seemingly out of the building and into thin air. I think I was sure that I was hallucinating, but still, I feel the need to investigate, right? So I walk over to it and reach for the handle, but I stop short. Weird sensation in the back of my brain told me that this was a bad idea. I looked around. Hallways were deserted except for me. I somehow convinced myself to push that feeling aside, and I opened the door. I was expecting to see a long drop to the mountains below, but instead I found myself staring at a bland hallway that was the same as the one I was standing in. Another corridor, but that didn't seem possible. For some reason, I just, I, I chose to take a step inside the newfound hallway. Immediately, the fluorescent lights illuminated the long hallway to reveal further corridors branching off into unknown spaces, and I found myself wanting to explore. As I got midway down the hall, though, that odd sensation of danger was tingling down my spine again, and I, I turned to leave. Only to find that the door I was just in, it, it didn't exist anymore. I was now just completely within this strange, abstract space. I mean, the, the, the door that I just stepped out of, it was... It was no longer there. Just another long corridor that seemed to stretch on into infinity. The walls and the carpet, they were all the same, so bland and meaningless that it was difficult to determine which way I was meant to go. I was beginning to realize that coming here was a mistake, and I began to wonder if I was dreaming. Sadly, though, no matter what method I used, I couldn't wake up. I decided to try to trace the hallways and determine where they went. Using a small lead pencil from my own pocket, I drew a line down the side of the wall. I figured it might be the only way that I could hope to find a way back to where I came from. For a long time, I kept tracing the wall to my right, figuring that it would take me somewhere different. I, mean, I, never, I never once encountered the line that I drew in front of me. I could tell that I was making progress, or at least I, I mean, it felt that way. I stopped after about ten minutes and began to second-guess myself, turning around, following the line back the way that I'd come. It took less than five minutes to reach the beginning. But I mean, but, but, but I mean, I've been wandering, I've been drawing for nearly half an hour. 
How is that even possible? I started to run down the corridor, turning left and right and hoping that the maze would finally just reach a climax. And then, just when I was beginning to lose hope of ever getting out, I saw a door again. I rushed towards it. I flung it open. The familiar setting of the office I was accustomed to returned, and I, I ran out. I looked back at the door. The door was gone. And the eerie experience was over. But it lingered with me that night. Even preventing me from sleeping, haunting my brain, making my body shake. I took as many sleep aids as I could, without overdosing at least. And I finally fell unconscious. I told myself it was simply an awful fear dream or something beyond my understanding. And I reassured myself that it would never happen again. Little did I know it would change everything about me and everyone that worked there. The following time I was at work, I was trying to take calls to forget about the weird experience that I had on the fourth floor. You know, when, when this strange noise came over my headset. At first I thought it was a glitch in my software, you know, like some kind of feedback. But then I heard a voice amidst the sound. Michael Long, come to the fourth floor, room 302, immediately. I mean, it was a robotic message, but it was so precise that I knew it wasn't a mistake. Someone was summoning me, because I'm both an idiot and so damn curious, I did as instructed. I went up to the room. The entire floor, it was just, it was deserted again, and part of me wanted to search for that damn door, but I kept on task. I found the room with no issues. There were two smartly dressed people inside, a man and a woman, and they were standing on the opposite sides of a long conference table. I mean, I didn't recognize either of them, but then again, this is a big place, so I doubted that I would have. Something about their demeanor told me that they didn't work for the call center. They were just like, I don't know, government or military. The, the woman confirmed this. Michael Long, please have a seat. My name is Emma Carter. I work for a think tank called Icarus, she said, offering me a drink. I did as I was told and realized why that eerie feeling was still in the air. As I said, you work for that other place that I went to, huh? I immediately recognized the mythical connections. Icarus. I mean, that's like an endless maze of some kind, and the legendary Icarus somehow was involved. My Greek literature's foggy from college, but the name, uh, it's catchy for sure. Icarus. Icarus's father built the labyrinth for a sole purpose, to keep a monster at bay. We made ours for another reason. We want to analyze the endless possibilities of virtual reality, the man said. Wait, so that, so that, that door, the one I went into yesterday, it was like a, like a, a simulation, a, a VR simulation or something? Carter gave me a tense smile. More like an evaluation. The mere fact you're able to see the door and then move also freely through the corridors, it's a major breakthrough. The man slid a small disc towards me, and when I touched it, a massive hologram revealed itself. The place that you stood on is more than just a virtual reality, it's an alternate dimension. We discovered a way to harness its energy and allow for passage between dimensions, but it's been extremely unstable. In fact, often we've been unsuccessful in being able to get anyone to even find the passage at all. We began to suspect that perhaps the issue wasn't the dimensional gate itself, but the subjects, he told me. The maze was larger than I had expected. In fact, it seemed almost endless. An impossible dream that kept circling like a, like a Mobius strip. How is this designed? Feels like it's, it's, it's far too advanced for anything we are ensuring from the center, right? I told them. Emma gave her co-worker a glance, and he gave a curt nod, giving her permission to speak. There's something about you and a few other select employees here at the Brighter Futures call center. 
We suspect that you might have certain biological markers that make it easier for you to pass across the gate. Do you recall when you were first interviewed and asked for multiple lab tests? She asked. I paused and I frowned. The memory was so vague that I hadn't even thought to register it. Are you saying that you only hired me because you wanted me as some kind of guinea pig? I asked as I stood up ready to walk out. I mean, I wasn't comfortable in being their stooge for this human experiment. And then I realized that was probably the case for everyone that worked here. All of us being used for this strange development. I suggest you calm down. If you walk out that door, there's a chance that the markers within you will begin to flux due to the fact that you've recently passed through the dimensions that you still have a connection to. In a sense, you are like Theseus from the legend, still trapped inside the labyrinth. But I wasn't listening. I, mean, I didn't care if they offered me thousands of dollars or some like lifetime stipend. This felt wrong. Was anything we did here even impactful or was it all simply for this other experiment I needed to know how many people have you been monitoring here I asked currently only you and five others should we successfully be able to determine the root of the simulation we should be able to do more by the end of the year Emma answered the the root okay so what's that supposed to mean are you are you saying you people didn't create it then suddenly it felt like my head was spinning the man was still standing and extending his hand as though to grab me from falling. We want to make you an offer. To return through the door and to observe and record everything you find there. Once we determine its origin and unlock its potential, our entire species can leap generations ahead in development and evolution, he said. You don't even know if I can make it back in one piece, I said as I opened the door and shook my head. Find another nameless lackey to do your bidding. Okay, I don't want any part of it, I said as I took a step out the door. Don't forget our warning. We are offering you the chance to return home. Without our help, the next time you traverse the blank spaces, you might not return home, Emma warned. I... I had no way of being sure if that was a threat, so instead of responding, I made good on my word, and I left. I closed the door behind me, and I walked straight ahead. As I suspected when I turned around, the door had disappeared. made me wonder if the people I had talked to had even been real. Was I hallucinating? I decided to clock out early and get a physical exam. I needed some kind of basis in reality to establish what was happening to me. But the quick physician showed nothing, and I couldn't afford any kind of scans. As far as I knew, I was still normal. So did that even explain what was happening to me? What if the experience itself was real? What was within the blank space that called out to me? I googled the Icarus think tank, but didn't find anything on it. Of course, I mean, I should have anticipated that. If they did work for the government, it was doubtful anything would be found on the project online. I tried to push it out of my mind. But as time passed, I saw that strange... blank door at all different times. Even when I was away from the office, it... it frightened me. I wanted to destroy it, and yet... and yet I was drawn to it at the same time. I thought I was crazy at first. Seeing strange doors out of nowhere? Dreaming about... about endless corridors? I mean, who... Who would think that was normal? And then, almost a week after my first incident, I heard a co-worker named Lucia mention that she was having issues to one of her friends. There was this weird, empty floor. I got lost in it last night. It took me hours to get back here, she explained. But the friend thought it was just a story. When we were alone, I took a risk. I revealed my own connection to this phenomenon. Lucia actually seemed relieved. I thought I was going crazy, she admitted. 
Has anyone talked to you about the doors? I asked. What? No. Nobody except you seems to know. Suddenly we had a connection that only we seemed to know about. But I was sure there was more. I told her how two strange people had tried to recruit me and steered her away. Her eyes got wider and more frightened with each word. This is some kind of conspiracy crap. So they haven't contacted you? I asked. No. Give me their names if you can. My father has a few old friends in the army. He might, he might be able to figure this out, she told me. I scribbled them down and I passed it to her. As she left, I felt a little relieved to think that I wasn't alone. I mean, maybe together we could solve this puzzle. And all the while, the strange tension I felt coming to work grew and grew, but this was a co-worker, I mean, a potential ally in this battle that was reaching out. I received an email from Lucia a few days later, but it warned me not to open it at the call center. The rest of that day, my heart was pounding. Her insistence to not open the email at work told me that we were, we were being monitored at the call center. I mean, did that mean that our supervisors were aware of what the government was doing and signed off on it? We needed proof. Maybe we could sue their asses for this or something. I opened the email as soon as I could at home, surprised to find that it was a video file of Lucia as she was walking towards the mysterious door that kept appearing for both of us. Here goes, everyone. See you on the other side, she told the audience. She stepped across the barrier, but the camera went haywire. This, this bizarre shrieking noise resonated across my brain. I nearly tossed my headphones across the room in response. I, I mean, I can't put my finger on it, but that noise was unearthly. The video eventually returned to a blank screen, and I, I heard heavy breathing, and Lucia was on the floor. But she looked like she'd been attacked. Then this, this creature, this, this shadowy thing, grabs her ankles and drags her off the screen. I tried to freeze the image to get a look at it, but I, I can only see fuzzy pixels. It, it didn't even look like it should exist. It wasn't even a, a three-dimensional shape. Yet it, it moved like a, like, a, like a living, breathing beast. Heavy breathing filled the recording and the camera moved. My heart skipped a beat as I recognized the man from the conference room. He had been a partner with this Icarus project. If you want your co-worker to live, come to room 302 tomorrow night. This video will self-destruct. Just like the old school movies whose words came true and the clip was corrupted. I sat there unsure how to respond. I should have called the police, but I doubt they would even believe me. Instead, I called my boss and requested to be placed on a graveyard shift again. I had to find out what happened to Lucia. I clocked in that evening around 8 p.m. and scheduled my break for 10. I'd only have a 30-minute lunch break to find the Icarus Men in Black again. And I prayed that it'd be enough. Just like before, I went to the fourth floor, started to wander. And the silence, it was, the silence was deafening. We no mystery doors this time, but it definitely felt like I was going in the right direction. And just when I felt like I should give up, a voice called to me. And I saw the man standing in a doorway. Immediately, I rushed him, pushed him inside and against the wall. Where is she? What did you do to her? Michael, that will be enough, the woman sharply commanded, but I was tired of playing by their rules. Taking out my ballpoint pen, I placed it mere inches for the man's pupil and shouted, I'm not doing jack until I know that woman is okay. I'm fine, Michael, a voice confirmed, and before I knew how to react, the man shoved me away, breaking my arm as he did. I fumbled onto the ground and looked across the table, stunned to see that Lucia was now on the other side in the same uniform as the others. I couldn't hardly move because of the pain, and I heard them mumble something to each other. Dexter, you went overboard, damn it, we need him, I heard Carter say. Someone came into the room and injected my arm with something even more painful than my break. I laid there for a moment, the room spinning as I felt my body begin to heal. The hell was that? I said as I realized I could move my arm again. Particles from within the alternate universe injected into your body to hyper-aggressively stimulate your natural healing, Emma told me, and then gave me a lopsided smile. Families in the medical field, please quit acting so dumbfounded all the time. You're creating products for medical trials now. What happened to trying to be cautious and testing this out? I asked, glaring at Lucia. What's happened to you? 
they brainwash you? The simplest way I can explain this is that I'm not the co-worker you remember, she responded. The man who identified himself as Dexter said that the labyrinth was like a web or a hall of yarn, and at the end of each of those unraveling strings was an alternate door that led to a different universe. So this pocket dimension, it's like, it really is like a connecting hallway to other realities. Something like that even possible, I asked. Again, this is why people like you are vital to understanding this phenomenon. My focus was on Lucia. Wherever you're from, were there also people there like me that could traverse the blank spaces? I asked. Quite so, Mr. Long. We found several. However, we had been unable to figure out why. Just as tests were done on you, similar tests were run on the ones that we could identify. There's nothing out of the ordinary. Or rather, the tests we ran weren't sufficient to produce the desired data, she told me. And you think that by going back, we could find more? I asked the group. All of them seemed in agreement with this idea, but I wasn't quite ready to budge and stick my neck out for such a risky operation. I want it in writing that if for some reason I die or disappear or whatever, this whole thing gets shut down here, okay? These people don't need to be involved. Take your nonsense somewhere else. You aren't exactly in a position to give a demand, Dexter reminded me. This is a negotiation, right? You need me to get this data collected, so what can you offer that I would be interested in? I countered. Dexter shifted uncomfortably, and Emma smiled, surprised by my tact. She nodded and said, fine. We don't need the call center anyway. It's just one of several vantage points that could get us in the blank spaces. Is there anything else you need, Mr. Long? A record of any other interactions with the dimension that you've managed to keep. Like, like, what you found on Lucia, the other Lucia, I mean. I said, nodding towards the one in the room. That record was sent to us deliberately. We viewed it as the first message that we had received from the other side. I paused, standing up and trying to wrap my head around what they were saying. So, Dexter wasn't there? I asked. I was. But once again, you're thinking in terms on the universe you understand and know. The iteration you saw on that screen was sending us a message. Of what? I can't say, Dexter responded. This is making my head hurt, I admitted. But I agreed to the terms, and I said that I would return first thing in the morning. They promised benefits, life insurance, triple my pay. They seemed desperate, if I'm being honest. And it made me feel like I had control of the situation. That, that couldn't have been further from the truth. The next morning at my desk, there was a note explaining that I needed to visit the company nurse and request a specific appointment time with a Dr. West. Supposedly, he would be the one to give me another serum, which would increase the likelihood of finding the blank spaces. Let's also record your thoughts onto a cloud service. Everything you're experiencing related to the other dimension will be filtered here for documentation, West told me. The injection reminded me of what Icarus had already done. It told me that once again, these people were keeping something secret and close to their chest. It felt exhilarating, though, to finally cross the threshold again. I mean, I've been thinking of the blank space for so long, and now to be face to face with potential answers, I actually opened the door without fear and stepped across into the virtual space. Wes told me that my very thoughts were being recorded, and I guess... I guess that freaked me out. But I tried my best to adapt and focus to the scenario in front of me. The corridors are spacious and plain, but also narrow and cramped. For such an empty space, they give a vibe of, of claustrophobia that I'd never felt before. It's been almost a day, although to be honest, I can't tell time like I used to. There isn't day or night here. I don't get tired or hungry. In fact, I don't think that I've even needed to use the bathroom. But I'm thinking about and wondering if my body was actually undergoing some metaphysical change with this dimension. The creature that I saw attack Lucia was... I mean, if, for example, it was only two dimensions. 
Could it be that within the space, everything exists outside of reality that we understand? It's a complete glitch in our perception of the universe. A road that's leading nowhere. On the second day, I found what looked like a different type of room. This one was black and square, and for some reason I got the feeling that it was near the center of the maze. There was a code on a door that led me to an inner chamber. On a whim, I typed in the word Icarus, and it opened. The room was dark. The oxygen felt light. It was cold and ethereal. I followed the sound of faint footsteps. Are those my own? I wasn't even sure why this room had suddenly existed. Was the space itself taunting me, leading me into a deeper hell? I soon found the answer as I rounded another corner. There were tubes. Tubes of people. All in stasis of some kind, hanging on the wall of the corridor. Each of them had a number carved under their pod, a, a Roman numeral. I saw that one of them looked like Dexter, another, another reminded me of a younger version of Lucia. I froze, I, I tried my best to, to not scream as I saw one marked with a Roman numeral for three, it looked like... like me. But its face wasn't finished. The features, they were still being completed by some unknown software that was constantly updating this, this fresh body. Was that really me? Did that new me have a, a soul? I was, was this all the product of some mad god? The end of the hallway led into a control room of some sort, data being compiled and calculated. Some of it didn't even seem possible. And on the screens I saw hundreds, if not thousands, of creatures that resembled that strange limber monster that attacked Lucia on camera, each of them roaming a different version of the maze. What are you doing here? A voice cracked the silence and I turned to see an older woman there, hair as white as snow, her eyes paler than the blue sky. She was holding a key in her left hand like her life depended on it. Icarus sent me, I told her truthfully. Icarus? So the first experiment was a success then. And now they've come to bargain, she said, as she walked past me and placed the key into a small slot next to the monitors. All of them began to rewind the videos and the shrieking of the monster echoed loudly as I covered my ears. I, I was told to document the origins of this place. Are, are, are you its creator? I asked. The woman laughed. My name is Levina Pickman. I wish I could take credit for this masterpiece, but I'm afraid not. Just another cog in the machine. But if you're telling the truth, it's already too late. Too late to stop any of this, the woman rambled. Icarus! Icarus is searching for answers. So am I. What made people like me and Lucia special? I asked. She turned to me, a gun now in her hand. As she fired one bullet into my stomach, I hunched over in confusion, and the old woman fired another in my kneecap. I should think that would be obvious. She paused as she stepped over me and put the gun to my head. You were born here. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. A man bearing a striking resemblance to Emma Carter stood over me and took off his glasses. You're awake. Congratulations, the surgery was intense, but we managed to pull you through it, he said. I'm sorry, where, where am I? I asked, looking out the window. The landscape reminded me of a rural Canada. Washington State, you were dead for like two hours, Mr. Long. And now, you're alive again. I took my arm. I saw a tattoo of a Roman numeral three. A shudder going up and down my spine. I didn't fully understand everything, but I knew that the memories of the maze and Icarus had to be true yet. Yet now it seemed as though I was in an entirely different body. A different long from a from a, a, a different universe. I got released from the hospital the next day. 
and it's been almost a month since then. I haven't heard from Icarus. There's no record of the life I knew. This Michael was an architect in, in a small Washington town. I, I told myself that I could try to live this life. I could make it my own. But my soul hurts. I know something beyond the veil of reality is still calling to me. I know one day in this new life, a door will appear and I'll, I'll have to step across back into that hell. And I pray that this time, I'm ready for what's on the other side. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast if you happen to be listening to this as a podcast or as a YouTube or however else you managed to have found this story for tonight. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who's supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while well, things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months. And things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane. And I mean that with all sincerity, that you guys have helped me immensely. So, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fensky, Jeff Burnett, Diana Krause, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster, Pettisqueezer, Gavis, Joseph Calarudo, Rudy B, Dante Kincaid, Foxhound 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Priorch, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff the Killer's Cultist, Love You M&M, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Ember Cork, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Captain Scurvy, Estabine, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sec Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinium, Lord Life's Best, Goring Trimagazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Limchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sam, Chelly J, Bacamel, The Leader Count, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Leader Chip, Acid System, Mom. Kiri the Sloth, Vester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams.